my name is Rob Cavallano, uh, Chief Engagement Officer at WorkTango. Uh, we put these on quite, quite frequently to talk about things on the mind of uh, business and HR leaders, especially in the, you know, the, the changing, uh, changing workplace, a little more faster changing than it has been in the past. Um, but, um, you know, my role today is to add a little bit of color, but really be the voice of everyone here. Um, someone just said, Rob, see you in my building all the time. We live on the same floor. Amazing. That's awesome. I have someone who could probably hear me uh, in surround sound from, uh, from the speaker and hear me personally. Probably not that far away. Um, but my role today is to play a little more of the voice of folks on this webinar. So when you have questions, I've been given complete um, uh, permission to interrupt <laughs> Celine as much as I, as I want to, uh, to dig a little deeper. Um, but I'm excited to, to be here. And I always get the pleasure of bringing on wonderful speakers to dig into things that they're experts in. And uh, I'm not going to do a very big introduction to Celine Williams today, but she's the founder of Revisionary. Spent the last 20 years working directly with leaders to facilitate, facilitate change in their organizations. And when we talk about this being a time of change, um, you know, uh, this is definitely one that we're looking into. Um, I've enjoyed our conversations and really excited to have her uh, her perspective on the topic today. Um, and one thing uh, that, uh, that I found out just, you know, on, she was talking to some of my colleagues that she really loves cats. Um, I think you're a big cat person, what I gathered there, is that true? I do love cats, I have too. And, and you jumped right into a cat conversation, it was great. Yes, I had my video and audio off and I came back and there was this whole cat conversation going and I just sat back and listened and then a big discussion on Tiger King came up, it was fantastic. Um, by the way, if anyone has any ideas of what I can, you know, binge watch on Netflix, throw it in the chat. Love to get some ideas. Um, so, uh, you know, well, this is basically the topic we're going to, uh, to discuss today. And before I hand it off to Celine, this, this topic is actually pretty near and dear to my, my heart when we talk about leaders. And it, it reminded me of a talk I did almost four years ago um, where I started the conversation and the talk with this slide. And... I always tell people, you're right, this isn't English. So if you're, if you're wondering what it is, it's not an English word. It's actually the Latin root words for the Italian world, a word called manageare. Um, so this is actually where the word manage comes from. Um, manus means, um, um, sorry, manus means hand and agere means to act. So literally the literal meaning of manage is using something with your hands like you're using a tool. And that always made me beg the question, are managers tools in our organizations? And, and, you know, are they a good tool that can help drive success of your employees and your business, especially through these times, or are they a bad tool? Um, and I actually looked up that definition of bad tool, and it's a fool that is characterized by low intelligence and self-esteem, right? And, and, and think about that. That's actually some of the, the way leaders are thought of in organizations. I just like this slide here. <laughs> but, but this is the, um, this bad persona leaders have in organizations. And, and my biggest bug in my bonnet when it comes to talking about leaders and managers is that I don't believe we're doing enough to enable them in organizations, right? Enable them to be successful, especially at these given times. And I always liken leaders to the concept of a cog in a system. So think about your organization. On one end, there's your, your leaders making strategic decisions every day, whether you're in a crisis or not. Then your employees on the other end conducting these activities every single day. But without leaders in the middle to make sure that things are being translated, to make sure that people are understanding the needs, you know, if you remove leaders from the system, the cog kind of falls apart, right? You know, the whole system falls apart. And I just believe they're so important, which is why I was really excited to talk about not just what HR is doing for, you know, through the crisis, how is HR making sure we can get remote work policies in and all of that. It was really bringing on a, a, you know, a leader in the space of enabling leaders and in a more specific way to lead them remotely. So um, that, I want to give that context because, again, I think it's really important to make sure we have our, you know, our leaders involved in this process, especially, you know, uh, in, in, in uh, parentheses there, specifically in this time of crisis. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to you, Celine, to uh, take it over now. And uh, as a reminder to people that have joined, I think another 40 people joined since we, I started talking, um, make sure you provide your questions and answers, and I'll, I'll do what I can to interrupt and ask them where possible. So... So the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you. I actually want to talk. So something you brought up uh, has brought something to mind that I want to share. And it is, I love what you were talking about managers and it's the, you know, acting with your hand. And, and I talk about this a lot and I think it's valuable to share right now is I actually make a big distinction. I don't like to use, I recognize that the word manager is used a lot out in the corporate world, right? I get that. 
And I only use the word leader for a very specific reason. You will not hear me say um, manager inside this presentation at all. And the reason I use that is that I fundamentally believe that we manage things and we lead people. And I am talking here specifically about the people side of this. That is my area of specialty and my focus. And so this is really about enabling leaders in the leadership of people because the th managing the things is not the most important thing right now. And so I just, I love that you started there and gave me a lovely thread to jump into this. Thank you, Rob. Love it. It was all set up and planned. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, so I do want to note that, oh, I just went one. No, I did that right. Hold on. There we go. Um, so to, I just want to um, emphasize what Rob said, and that is that please do ask questions and jump in. I am not married to, you know, I've said this to Rob, I'm going to say to you, I'm not married to getting through the specific things that I want to talk about. If you're on this webinar and you feel like there's something that you want to dig into more and have questions about, I am very flexible inside of this. If we don't get to anything and you get the slides later and you have a question, you can email me. It's totally not a problem. I'd rather this is valuable to the people that are on the webinar now than not. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself, more about why this matters to me. So um, I have worked uh, it, almost 20 years now, not over thankfully yet, but almost 20 years uh, with leaders directly in various ways. I run businesses. I've worked in the corporate world. Um, I had a, I dipped my toe into HR for a couple of years, um, but I did a lot of change management specifically and facilitation of, um, of large uh, bodies that made decisions on certain pieces of information that affected government bodies in Canada. So I've in, been involved with leaders from either me influencing them in a specific way, me leading teams, or me working with them, depending on the role, and especially now in the last seven years that I've, you know, been a consultant and been an executive coach, my role has changed even more to be working directly with leaders and organizations on leadership and culture specifically. So there will be a bit of an overlap between the two because I think they are um, intrinsically linked. Um, the other thing I want to say is the reason that this is so near and de dear to my heart beyond that is that I was working on teams that, that uh, we called it telecommuting or dispersed teams um, 16 years ago. So for those of us that remember working 16 years ago, the internet was not as fast as it is now. The tools that we have like Zoom were not available. The, the you know, the conference tools were basic at best. So I have been Again, I've led remote teams. I've worked on remote teams. I've worked for remote leaders. I've worked. I've never worked in an office where everyone was in the same place at the same time after my first year of being in corporate. So I am very passionate about this because I know the challenges that people are facing as well as the potential for what this entails. So I want to give you that context because I will talk to my experience and, and um, the people that I've spoken to and their experience and there is still room for whatever your experience is in this in terms of questions and answers. So this is not, I do not have all of the answers. There's not one right way to do this. Um, I want to talk to how to enable you to make it as easy as possible for the leaders in your organizations. Um, and so there we go. Okay, so today we are going to focus on a few things. Um, we are going to start with the idea of what's so different about remote leadership anyway. I'll talk about remote leadership, which is valuable for HR to know in terms of dealing with the challenges that remote leaders are facing. And let's be honest, HR is now remote also, right? If for those of us that are actually still working, and I recognize there's not everyone who is still working and that's not a reality for, for um, some companies and some positions and some roles, but for most of us who are still working, we are remote and that includes HR and most HR teams, um, unless they are an entirely remote company, have not worked remotely either. So this is valuable for you because we are all leading in some way and HR does have a leadership role and also to enable 
the leaders in the organization to lead as effectively as possible. So I'm going to talk a little bit about rules of engagement, how they need to shift here, um, and how HR can help leaders navigate that change and that new reality. I'm sure you all have heard many webinars, many conversations about communication. I am going to touch on this a little bit because there are some new norms in the remote world and not, and I want to be really clear, I'm not going to be talking about the technology of this. So I have, I have seen many webinars and many conversations around how to use Zoom correctly, how to, you know, what goes in Slack or Messenger versus, we're not talking about that. This is the people to people, how we communicate and how we set up the structures around that. And what works better in a remote team versus an, an in-office team. So I, I want to make that really clear so no one is thinking we're going to get into the technology of it. Um, how to help leaders create and maintain culture when going remote. And in this case, when they've already been remote for anywhere from one to four weeks. So culture is just as if not more important when we are remote. And so we'll talk a little bit about how you can help leaders and how you yourself on your own teams uh, can create and maintain the culture so that when things go back to the office, if they do, if you decide to create a part work from home, whatever shifts, you're in the best position to have the culture set up for success, whatever this looks like in three, six, 10 months. Um, remotional intelligence. So I want, this, I want to interrupt. Did you yeah. come up with that? I love that. Remotional intelligence. Like where did that come from? Did you make it up? Is it like, I did. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've, um, thanks for interrupting and thank you for that. So I'm actually writing a book on emotional intelligence and this came up because so I've been training on emotional intelligence for a long time. Um, it's often a lot of us who sort of are in the leadership executive coaching space have a specialty in this. It kind of, it often goes hands in hand, hand in hand. And because of all the work that I've done on remote teams and because so many of the companies I work with have been partially remote or partially work from home, uh, this came together because I realized that emotional intelligence is great, but there's like an added layer of complexity when the teams are remote. And so I started t doing these trainings on what I was calling emotional intelligence, cultivating emotional intelligence in a remote world. And so I'm not going to get into all of the pieces of that, but I want to just give you a few things to be aware of when it comes to the emotional intelligence that managing yourself and managing others that are, it's at a different level when we are remote because we don't, excuse me, even with video, right? So I can see you, Rob, and I can read your body language a little bit and I can see your expressions a little bit, but it's not the same. <laughs> Sorry, sneak off the screen now, put you on the spot, but it's still not the same as being in person. And that's what we're used to. And our emotional intelligence is used to the in-person interaction. So we're going to touch on that a little bit. Um, question, we're going to talk about questions, uh, very, very briefly. I cannot emphasize enough how important questions are. You'll see a few things that are repeated in this presentation on a few different slides because they are my go-to with the leaders that I'm working with. And I want to really emphasize it here and that'll come up in questioning a little bit. And then I'm going to talk really quickly about ghost expectations and how to identify and eliminate them and why they're that much more insidious inside a remote team. Perfect. I'm excited about all these things. And if anyone watching, it, you know, has uh, something specifically they might have wanted to get out of the conversation, you know, throw them in the Q&A and chat and I'll be monitoring them to make, see if I can kind of squeeze them in at a certain point um, or at the end. So, um, so appreciate the, the update there. It's, uh, it's good to know what we're going to talk about. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, exactly what Rob said. If there's, if, if you feel like, um, there's something here that, or there's something else you want to get into, we can absolutely get into that conversation. Yeah, one just popped up and it was a culture of intense meetings. Um, so there might be a place where you can infuse that in one of those eight items. Um, intense me means all day long. <laughs> um, Got it. So, you know, again, that might be, have a story, but if you can infuse that in, that'd be great too. Um, yes, so uh, that's actually great. And we will, I will talk a little bit about that on one of the slides. I don't remember which one it is exactly now, but. Um, I will talk about that. And if I don't answer it or we don't get into exactly what your specific situation is, feel free at that point in time to add more context. 
Um, so thank you for that. That's a very good question. Okay, so here's the first thing with remote leadership that I want to get into, and that is this idea that um, I hear all the time. I was telling Rob this the other day. The probably the most common thing I've heard recently from leaders that I work with who are now running remote teams is that, well, it's not a big, I mean, leadership is leadership. People are just in a different place. Level. It's not going to make that big a difference. We're just going to do what we were doing. Just now people are at home. That's not real. People are in a new location. I need to emphasize this. People are in a new location and there are new rules as a result from, as a result of that. It's not just we're doing what we were doing in the office, except now we're at home. And it's really important for leaders to recognize that. And um, HR has a very, HR can enable that conversation and create, you're going to, I'll talk about holding space and creating space quite a bit here, because that's a big thing that HR can do is create the space for that conversation um, and create the ability for those leaders to recognize what that really looks like uh, for them um, and for their team. So one of the things that you mentioned, Rob, was that, some companies are going to have a remote uh, a, re a remote or work from home policy, or they may be in the process of or have created an emergency policy. If you haven't, that is a very important thing to be working on right now. I fully recognize that. Um, and it may not be enough for each of the teams, right? So it's good to have a blanket policy. It's good to have that in place and you know, I saw something on work time, I'm totally picking on you, Rob, for this, but I saw something that came, that I think you sent out yesterday with a survey around remote work. And one of the things that you had found so far, one of the things that stood out to me was that 10% of employees feel their company is sort of prepared for remote work. And I might be, I might be, I might've misquoted the exact language, but it's something around there that popped up last night. And I thought yeah. that's so interesting because that's not just the tools that we have. That's not just the overall policy, that's how they're feeling in their teams and with their leaders. And so this is where it becomes more than just, let's create a um, remote work or an emergency plan, important, but then having that translated down to each team where it is recognizing the new rules for how that team functions is super, super important. And HR can enable that conversation, can base it on the, um, on the policies that they are creating or have created to date. Um, so the minds, there's a mindset shift that happens when we are going from, and I want to, and I do want to say this, it is not only a leadership mindset shift, it is an employee mindset shift, it is an HR mindset shift, but it is a different way. We are thinking about work differently. We are thinking about the barriers between work and home differently. We are dealing with different situations right now. And a lot of leaders, a lot of people that I'm speaking to who are new to this are not actually acknowledging that they have to think about it differently. So because there is a crisis at play, we revert into um, what is the thing that's going to keep me safe? And those are the patterned ways of thinking that I, that I already have. So the things that have got me to where I am right now, I am going to really lean into those things that feel familiar because so much of what's out there is scary. So much of what's out there is unknown. And if we don't enable the conversation, if we don't allow that mindset shift to be part of what we're talking about, people tend to revert more and more and more into what feels familiar and known. And that's not going to serve them right now. We have to be having conversations, not about what it, and, and I want to be really clear. This is not about the numbers that are happening with the pandemic. This is not about the potential financial crisis. This is not about, you know, what work, you know, how the, this company is going to have to lay people off. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a whole other piece. I mean, the shift in mindset around how we are dealing, how we are dealing with the day-to-day the -day things that are in our purview, how our team works, how we are conversing with people, how we think about teams and work and the barriers and not barriers that are there. So it is a different way of thinking about work in general. Um, and 
having that conversation, making space for that conversation, actually asking leaders about that specifically can just enable the conversation and the flow. Um, I think I have more conversations now with the leaders that I coach that are talking about this, where I will ask how, you know, not just a, how are you feeling, but how are you um, dealing with these changes? How are these changes affecting you or your team? What are you seeing in your team? And that gets into the mindset and the acknowledgement of how things are changing and seeing the difference. And, so sorry, just because a question came about specifics yeah. around a policy or like what, like when you say things are changing, like what are those mindset shifts? Like what, is there anything specific that we can wrap our head around? Like when you say this is, this is, you know, what leaders might be seeing as a shift. I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. No, you're totally fine. And, and I actually, so I'm going to ask this question. So when asking about the policy, is it about mindset or, or mindset? Just sounds out of my mouth at this point. Okay. It's Thursday. Uh, is that mindset specifically, or do you mean more of like the work from home or emergency work policy? Because I wonder if that's more directed at that than the mindset. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Maybe the person that asked that question could get specific. I'm just, cause you mentioned a lot around, you know, mindset shift or the changes. And I just when yeah. you're acknowledging what exactly are we acknowledging? That's what I kind of wanted to get an example of. Um, that it is. So that's a great question. And I'm going to give you a very unsatisfactory answer because it's different for different people. So there are leaders going into this who have never worked from home, who have never had colleagues that work from home. And so there, the mindset shift for them is, um, it can be, re it, they are facing challenges around um, how to manage time, the number of meetings, right? We're talking about the person had a question about the, uh, a, a full day of meetings, right? So they're booking meetings the same way. They are dealing with people the same way. They're not communicating in different ways. And there's an entire shift in terms of how we think about work. Work is no longer, I'm actually, I'm gonna jump into something that will come up later. So I may, what you see on the slides, full acknowledgement right now, what you see on the slides is gonna change a little bit because I'm gonna jump into something I was gonna say later now, because I think it's important. Um, no longer do we, can we think about work when people are working from home, when people have kids at home, potentially when they have loved ones in their space, when they may not have a separate, like I have the benefit of a private office. Not everyone does. Some people are working from a kitchen. Not everyone, you know, has the same things that we think that, you know, that we would have in an office environment. So uh, the mindset shift from work happens nine to five, we sit at a desk, we do it this way, we are productive in this way, that has to change because, and, and, I, and I will give you an example. I uh, have a leader uh, that I work with who's uh, the person that they report to has a you know, gi giant home that is well serviced where they have this beautiful private office you know, they have kids, their wife take care, takes care of the kids during the day, they're being homeschooled, this person's life is not effective, so he affected. So he goes into his office, you know, from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m., his wife brings him lunch, and he sits at his desk, and they were on a call, and he was like, working from home is great, this is easier, I don't have to commute, I have food brought to me, this is phenomenal, I'm just, maybe we'll institute some some, you know, weekly or, you know, everyone gets to work from home a couple of days a week. So that is not a mindset shift. That is a, this is work. This is me working from home. It is the exact same thing. Now, for anyone who was on that call, imagine how dismissive or non-uninclusive that feels when they don't have a private office or when they are the ones who are dealing with the kids kids or when they are the ones who they can't work eight to five because they have other things that they have to do. So they're trying to work, you know, 10 to 12 and one to three or wherever they, and then, you know, 11 PM at night, whatever that is. So taking that mindset of work hours are this, I'm giving one specific example, but this is the way it looks. And now this is it at home. That's not a mindset shift. It has to be a conversation to get them into understanding that it's not the same thing. Yeah. 
it's actually interesting, right? Like I, you know, I don't have children, nothing's running around. I have no other responsibilities throughout the day. And then Steven is also on this call. One of my colleagues has three beautiful daughters that, you know, now are doing schooling from home and, and there's, there's things that happen. So I, I can understand the mindset, mindset shift from that perspective, or I have friends that are principals of schools and their teachers have never taught from home and used technology to do so. And it's a, just a different world that they're in. So, um, so I appreciate some of the, you know, the kind of examples there. It's a, uh, uh, just to get some kind of secret teeth into it. Yeah. Um, no, no. I, and, and, and mindset is the one, and that's why when the policy question I was asking, if it was actually about policy or mindset, because mindset is the, it's a challenging one to be specific about beyond like, here's a few specific examples because everyone has a different mindset. And the idea is to shift people into being more inclusive, getting into the inclusive, right? To being more inclusive, to asking a question, to, to allowing people the, the time and space to say, look, I appreciate that for the rest of the team, you can work from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. But the way I have my life set up with my husband or my wife or my partner is that I'm taking care of the kids 9 to 12 so he can work or she can work or they can work. And then I'm working in the afternoon because that's the only way we can make this, this function. So allowing people the space inside of the teams and inside of their, the conversations to, to be flexible, to be inclusive of these things, to shift the mindset so that a, a leader is not saying, well, that person's not working hard enough because it doesn't look the way it looked in an office. Okay. Does that, yeah. does that make more sense? Yeah, no, helpful for me. And I know uh, someone asked a question about policy and I know uh, in the chat, there was an article kind of uh, added to that as well, if someone wants to reference it. So that might uh, add some additional color as well. Yeah, and I actually have, um, I, can, I can add this, I can't add it in the chat because I'm not gonna search it while we're in this, but I actually, a friend of mine who heads HR for a remote company, she's actually, she actually put together an article around what an emergency work from home policy needs to include and how it's different from a general remote work policy and that may be helpful for people as well because it that's where you get into the technical the real technicalities of how things work yep. and then each team should then take that and we'll get into this on the um the next slide uh should be able to take that and make their own norms inside of it okay and shoot it over we'll make a part of the uh the, the resources that people can get access to yeah 100 percent um because i think it's really val it's very straightforward and it's super valuable um, so this idea of context is going to come up multiple times, um, because I am, uh, the thing that I say more than anything is that context is king. And the reality is that when we are in the same space as people, when we are sharing an office, when we are physically, uh, interacting, we pick up on context and we are involved in different conversations in a different way and so a lot of us do not ask for context um, as much as we could or should simply because we have an awareness by being in the same space as people one of the most important things that we have to do when we work from home and this goes by the way for leaders as well as hr is that we need to be asking for more context specifically. And this is not about this, the, the kind of questions we're asking. This is to understand what has happened to get things to this place, to get discussions to this place, whether there's problems that are coming up, whether there's dynamics happening inside of teams, whether people are complaining about this person's not doing this thing. We have to spend the time getting more context now more than ever. Um, and it's not, it's not, this, we tend to rush through things, right? And now, especially with everyone doing more things, feeling like there's more things on their plate, we rush through to get to an answer. Um, and this gets into the, the inviting problems, not just solutions. We cannot be just looking for solutions right now. We actually have to be looking at the problems differently and getting context for the problems and recognizing that people are going to be seeing things, bringing things forward, um, aware of different things that we're not aware of because we're not all in the same space. So being open to actually talking about the problems and getting the context and understanding more 
of what is happening as much as we can uh, and not to rush through it is, um, is more vital than ever in a remote environment. And I will say this, for organizations that are, and leaders that are very solutions focused, which is a fantastic thing. I am not, I am not saying anything negative about that. It is a fantastic thing. And it can mean that going remote and dealing with times of crisis like this is more challenging for them because people don't have as many solutions right now. People are, we are stuck in the problems. We are stuck in the not knowing what's coming. And so making that space and inviting people to bring problems forward and getting the context as much as possible and spending that time is more important than ever. Cool. Yeah. A couple of things that I've other empathy training things I've gone yeah. through. It's been, you know, it's not just listening. It's really understanding because how do you really get context unless you can kind of understand the environment that, that person's going through, whether it's external or internal things we can see or not see, but also on the invite problems part of it. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of that squeaky wheel. Like you'd rather know if the customer is angry versus just having someone leave your, you know, leave as a customer. Um, so just that, those conversations I think are important. So maybe it's not inviting the problems, it's just the context and the, the conversations and understanding that they might be there as opposed to turning a blind eye or not looking for them in the first place. So, um, you know, those are two things that I think are really interesting points I take out of this. Uh, and I appreciate that. And, and I use it and I appreciate what you're saying about uh, not necessarily problems. I, I do use that. I use that term on purpose because it's uncomfortable for people and it doesn't have to, I'm not saying these are massive problems necessarily, but we, we are often, and so many leaders are often, you know, they want the solution or you're going to come and tell me that this thing is happening. And here's three ways that we could address it. People may not have those three ways right now. You know what I mean? Like that's the thing is that this really is about making that space and, and keeping it open. And to, uh, you know, what you're saying about, about empathy, which I think is super, it, it's really important. And the reason that context is separate from empathy is that empathy is trying to, if we're in a conversation, Rob, empath, my empath, if I'm being empathetic, I'm trying to understand you and how you're feeling. I'm not so worried about all of the context beyond you and your experience of it. Once I have done that, and that is a really important thing to continue doing. Once I have done that, I also need to get more context. Yep. And that is that, and then it is, and then it becomes the, not just one like singularly focused, but it becomes that systemic. Let's, let's look at this, the, the interrelations and the, and the systemic play of these things. Right. Yeah. This on, on my other desk at the, at the other office, I have this uh, sign that says replace blame with curiosity. Right. So it's, it's not yes. this concept of like something's happening. It's like, if I'm not understanding or getting that context, then it's, you know, it's going to be tough to be empathetic. Totally. Um, so I want to jump into rules and we get, and I, and I warned Rob that I always put too much before we had started this. I was like, I have too much information in here and too many things I want to talk about. Cause this is my constant problem in life. So if this feels like I'm rushing through anything, um, again, ask a question or reach out afterwards because I, I want to try and sort of touch on some of these key things as much as possible. Um, so rules of engagement. So this is where the, um, this is when you have a work from home policy, they tend to be company wide, right? Whatever emergency or not, this is more of a company wide. This is our sort of overall policy. I think of rules of engagement and the leaders I work with, we use rules of engagement to be more for the team, how this team works together. So overall company culture is super important. And then on each team, there's a subculture. So this is like your subculture of how these teams work together. And HR, um, a lot of the HR leaders that I have been speaking to recently are creating emergency work from home policies. Uh, and looking at potentially creating remote work policies that apply to the whole company, but then they're not taking the time or they're not, they, they weren't kind of looking at how each team is implementing and making it work for them. And I think this is a huge opportunity for HR to really enable the leaders to not just say, okay, this is it. And you know, this is the overall policy. There's no room for discussion and there's no room for us to play inside of it. HR can really say, great, this is the overall policy. And now what does that look like for you and your team? And how are you fitting that in? 
So a couple of things that become really important is, and I already touched on this, but the idea of scheduling, um, getting people involved in the process to say, here's when I'm most available for this. Here's when I'm not available for this. Here's what works best for me. Here's what doesn't on each team individually. So they have a rule, they have rules of engagement for themselves. Um, daily check-in. So to go back to the person who asked about meetings, this is where I'm going to talk a little bit about meetings. So if what I, if this isn't helpful or what you meant, please, as I'm speaking, you know, ask a clarifying question or touch on this. Um, so one of the, I was speaking to a CEO a couple of weeks ago, I was actually um, interviewing him for, I'm doing a, I'm putting together a series on leading through crisis. It's a conversation series. And I was talking to him about this and we were talking about when his company went entirely remote, the biggest challenge they had was meetings. The number of meetings that people were in, how they were communicating in those meetings. And we talked about what he has found um, to be the, the most effective way of doing these things and, and, and of running these meetings to minimize the amount of meetings that were in because they were finding that they were in back-to-back -back meetings all day, every day when they first went remote. So the first thing was to do daily check-ins. And that is um, once a day, beginning of the day, middle of the day, a time that works for people. It does not have to be 8 a.m. if not everyone is available at 8 a.m. because they have something else they're doing. So make it a time that works for the majority of people every single day, a 15 minute check-in, your team is on the phone together or on Zoom together and you are, you know, everyone is okay. No one needs anything. Is anyone getting, is anything getting in your way from being able to do the work that you're doing? So Agile has a great methodology around this. You can look that up if you want to, to, to see how they run it, but a daily check-in is super important. I'm going to go one step. Go ahead, Rob. No, I, yeah, I was sorry. I was going to say it was uh, just on the point of daily check-ins, a question came in and said, we're following all the check-ins. How do we know when daily check-ins become too much as we continue to work? And and I was actually just going to respond to that. I've been doing daily check-ins in three different companies for 17 years. Like in my opinion, they never stop. Uh, and in the time of a crisis, um, especially at a team level, I mean, most of what I've done is company level. Um, you know, it's important for people to have that opportunity to connect and have everyone in one place. Uh, and that's the only commitment I ask from people is like, just make sure you're there in one place for, you know, nine minutes or 15 minutes a day. Um, but what you said, I think is the biggest um, success point in these daily we call them daily tangos is that if at one of the agenda items what we call a red flag or a cry for help so the moment that some you have an issue it might be a customer might be internal whatever it is anyone can say i have a red flag here's the two people i need to talk to and when that meeting's done everyone's in one place it's easy for them to go off and have that discussion so i find so much value especially remotely where this is one time to get everyone together if you have a flag bring it up and you can kind of eliminate a lot of those ad hoc discussions a little later so um, I, I want to hear your question to that or your answer to that as well, Celine, but uh, I spent so much time doing these daily check-ins and I believe so much in the value of them. So I thought I would try and answer that one as well. I 100% agree. I don't think it's a thing you stop doing. And I think teams that run in agile environments, they do them every day and they continue to do them no matter what, because they are super effective. One of the, uh, a company that I used to do some work with, they're, they're, and this may be an agile kind of standard. I don't remember specifically. It's been a few years, but their, their, one of their agenda topics in every daily check-in was who or what is your rock? So that is who or what is the thing that is standing in your way? And in that meeting, they could say, you know, my rock is Rob and I need this from him. And they could call it for what it was. And then, it, and this is slightly different than what you're talking about. Whereas it's like, here's a cry for help. I need help in this specific thing. But if it's like, listen, Rob, I need this approval from you and I haven't got it yet. You are my rock right now. You are now aware of it in a way that's not aggressive. It's not personal. It's not negative feedback, but you can actually do something about it because it was, that is, a, that is an important thing that needs to get brought out. So I think having structure around the check-ins is really important to what you're saying, but to still have yeah. them every day. I've been called worse things than a rock. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Um, right. A couple of people here that said they've started daily check-ins, um, but they're not pressing people to join. Um, which is, you know, great if it's a drop in. And another comment said, people that don't join, remember, they might not just because they're avoiding it, they might be on another call, they might be doing something else. And sometimes we have people do, you know, check in their top one or make sure they're, you know, they wish they could be there. But that's a good point as well is there's, it's kind of that uh, mindset, right? You think because people are absent or that they're doing something else or not wanting to be there, they might be taking care of their kid or, you know, or right. on another important call with a client. So good point uh, on that one. 
Yeah. And I think that's really important to be aware of, especially now that people are at home and things are different, right? Yeah. So, so that's why I find that, you know, you want to find a time that works ideally for most people and you have to be flexible and give them some grace. Things are, things are not quote normal right now. And people are managing that the best, the best that they can. So, so give them that great, giving them that grace is really important. And as a leader, if you, if there is someone who is not coming to a lot of these meetings, or if there is someone on your team who reports to you that you're not seeing really participate, reach out to that person directly. And this is the other thing I would say is like, I think a daily check-in for a team is really important. And I will tell you right now in crisis that um, leaders who are even sending a text or a quick message or whatever it is to their direct reports every day, just to be like, Hey, how are you handling things? Want to make sure you don't need anything from me, whatever it is, something quick and dirty. It doesn't have to be a conversation that those people are feeling much more supported. And I hear it over and over again from the people that I work with. So having that, and I get that in an, it's this, if you were in an office and your person was at the desk next to you, when you walked by, you'd be like, Hey, how's it going? Good. Having a good day. Amazing. That is, you're not, you can't do that right now. So actually putting a tiny bit of effort in to reach out and just make sure people are okay or they need anything from you or what it is to your direct reports goes a long way right now. Um, and I want to jump into this one-to-one or team meeting, because this is the other thing that, that, um, you know, I talked about with, uh, Chris, who I was speaking about, and that is the idea that any one-to-ones that you normally have, right? Because whether it's that are normally on your schedule with the people that report to you, um, that, you know, coaching calls, whatever you want to call them, those remain the same. There's no change in that. That cadence should not change. Please keep doing that. Those are important touch points for people. And what we need to stop doing with remote teams is if I need something from you, Rob, and Stephen, I know you're on mute, but I'm going to pick on you because you're the two names that I can see right now. So if I need, if I am doing something and I need information to share something with Rob and Stephen, I reach out to Rob. I set up a call with him. I have a 15 minute call or a half an hour call. And then I set up another meeting with Stephen to go over what I talked about with Rob. We are so used to exchanging information in this way that we do it even when we're working remote. And this is one of the reasons we end up feeling like we are on calls back to back to back all day. If you have something to discuss that is going to affect more than one person, you set up a meeting with all the people that it could affect. Full stop. 15 minutes. You have a set agenda. You're looking for a decision or you're giving information and you make it 100% clear. You do not book one-to-one meetings unless it is only that person who could be affected by what you're talking about. So that is, again, it is a, it's a change because we don't have the ability to step into someone's office or step by their desk and, and have that conversation. Um, I want to, I'm going to talk about expectations and outcomes really quickly, and then we'll move on to the next slide unless people have questions. And that is one of the most one of the things that happens most when we go from an office environment to remote is that we think we are used to subconsciously like it or not. The number of hours that someone is at their desk is a direct line to their productivity. We know what we feel like, and it's an illusion. We know what they're working on or what they're doing because we can see them and they're at their desk. So they're working. First of all, that's not real. But more importantly, when people are working from home, we don't have that. And this is where setting really clear KPIs, outcomes, things that people are working on, and then releasing how they get there and letting them do it without interruption, without micromanaging, becomes more and more important. And most companies don't actually do a good job of setting those KPIs and those outcomes specifically inside of the day-to-day things or the projects that people are working on. And so doing this upfront and doing this now and encouraging HR, encouraging leaders and helping them create a framework for it, create a template for it, whatever needs to happen to make that work and reminding them that it's not just because they can't see people working doesn't mean they're not working is going to become a big part of the conversation right now. And that's okay. It's just important to be mindful of that. Right. 
I want to be conscious of time. I know there's about 13 minutes. So I want to make sure if there's things, specific things you want to get through saying that, that would be right, really great takeaways, et cetera. Um, I want to make sure you get to it. And there's also a couple other questions as well. So um, yeah. just want to be, be the time check guy here. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do a really quick overview of communication. You can't communicate too much right now and you can't be too transparent. And what I mean by that is you do not have to tell people that leaders do not have to tell people that they are struggling and life sucks and they don't know what's going to happen. And, and they're, you know, negative. It's, that's not what I mean by transparent. However, it is okay for leaders to say, I don't know what this is going to look like in six months and I'm doing the best I can. And I'm going to keep you informed along the way. I have a client who sent out an email, 5,000 person organization. And he sent out an email a couple weeks ago. And this was like, he just kind of wanted to put this out and he basically acknowledged this is difficult times things are changing here's what I'm struggling with a lot of unknowns and here's what I'm really excited about and I'm thinking positively and I'm very impressed with how people in this organization are showing up and I really hope everyone is doing okay and this is what's happening and to that email he had over 600 replies in less than 24 hours we cannot be communicating too much right now. And we cannot, that vulnerability and that transparency makes people feel like we're talking directly to them. The more we can be doing that, the more we're going to be helping people feel like there's a community around them and feel like they're not in this alone, like we're in this with them. And that's really important right now for people's mental health, for people. Um, to feel some sense of stability in a time that feels really, really unstable. Uh, And a really quick um, suggestion for both HR leaders and general leaders, and this is the office hours note on here. Some, one of the things I've seen that's been really effective is that people set up office hours, whether it's every other day or once a week or whatever it is. So HR says, you know, I'm available. An HR leader says, you say, I'm available this 90 minutes. I'm going to be in a Zoom room. If you have a question that can be answered in about 10 minutes, you come in, I lock the room. We have our Q&A. I let you out. The next person can come in. And if, if someone comes and the room is locked, they know to come back in about 10 minutes. So having virtual office hours where it's almost like someone can step in and it's taking that sort of university idea of office hours where someone's in the office waiting and you can go if you want really is very effective and people know that they can reach out and there's a lifeline there if they need it. So I really recommend thinking about how that could work in for HR, but also for your leaders so that their teams feel supported right now. Great. I'm just going to pause quickly just because, yep. um, there was an interesting question, and this might be a, a really easy answer, I mean, not so easy answer, but is emotional intelligence rude in relationship intelligence? Sorry, can you say that one more time? Is emotional intelligence rude, rooted in, <laughs> thank you for correcting that, rooted in relationship intelligence? Is it, remo- is it r- removed? <laughs> rooted. <laughs> it's like Friday, don't uh, uh, It is, I mean... It's not in the sense that it is and it isn't, right? Emotional, emotional intelligence, the whole concept came from emotional, the application of emotional intelligence in, remote, in a remote world and specifically on remote teams. So relationship intelligence is going to be part of emotional intelligence. I don't think it's a, I don't see it as a fully separate thing. I think they're all inter- interrelated, um, but what I've, you know, my concept of emotional intelligence and what I put together is not specifically from relational intelligence, if that, or relationship intelligence. Right. Kind of a marriage of these things. Um, okay. So I'm just looking at the time. Um, here's what I want to say about culture. Um, in difficult time. So when things are going really well, culture is easy. It is. It just is. It's not a thing we really think about. I always talk about culture like a sandbox. So if you think about your culture as your sandbox with the, you know, wooden barriers being the outside of your sandbox, 
normal times, good times, happy times, everyone is playing in the sandbox together. There might be that group over there who's building a sandcastle, and there might be this group over here who's like digging to China, and there might be that group over there who's pouring water in and playing in the mud, but everyone is playing in the same sandbox together. Times like this test the sandbox. This is where people are picking up sand and throwing it out of the sandbox and they're dumping it over the edges because it's difficult and we don't, if things aren't explicit and we aren't really clear on what that looks like and we're running on assumptions and we're running on this is how things work without being explicit, those barrier, that, that sand is gonna end up out of the sandbox. And so this is a time where teams, even if it's not at an HR level, but where teams can really be reinforcing and being explicit about what the barriers of the sandbox are and putting that into, into play and into language. Um, and I really encourage HR to, and this goes back to the rules of engagement as well. I really encourage HR to help the leaders do that because it, it is, vital in the best of times, but more important now than ever. Um, I'm not going to get super into the vision matters more than ever and the why of it all, but what I do want to, what I will, uh, what I will say, I am going to, I have a, a friend of mine who um, has a TEDx talk on the importance of aligning around purpose in times of, he doesn't call it crisis, in times of chaos. And I'm actually going to, I'll send that to you, Rob, to put in the show notes as well as a reference. I think it would be very helpful for people because having a, uh, an aligned purpose right now and understanding it and being explicit about it will really help people feel like what they're doing matters. Because a lot of what people are struggling with is that it doesn't matter anyways. Nothing, none of this is going to matter. Great. Um, well, actually, what's interesting is there was one thing on that slide there that talked about create opportunities for social connection. And I think it, it came up as a, as a question here, just suggestions how to lift spirits of employees. And, and I kind of get that into a bit of an, when I read that, I think about how do you engage them and lift spirits throughout this time. Um, yep. and, and my initial reaction is, first off, don't change what you're doing. Um, adapt, right? So don't, don't just like, media eliminate what you're doing to engage employees today adapt it and somehow try to make it fun. I mean, still have those meetings, uh, whether it's virtually versus others. Um, you know, we did things where we have our meetings now, people show what's one cool thing in their house that they, for their prized possession, you get to know a little more about your team. So there are ways to make sure that you don't eliminate engagement from the whole equation in this time, um, just adapt it based on what you're currently doing. But on that idea of lifting spirits or social connection, I want to see something, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I do actually, thank you. I'm glad someone asked. Um, so yes, continue doing what you're doing to engage people. That is a really valuable point, Rob, because I think people can drop it now more than ever. And I don't think that is helpful at all. Create other opportunities for social connection. So some of the things that I have seen that work really well are book clubs or teams reading a book together right now so that they're, they feel like they're connected around a specific thing. Um, virtual pizza parties is, it sounds, very much like something you do in grade school. And let me tell you the number of teams I know that are really enjoying virtual pizza parties right now. Um, doing things like, um, oh, I just had another one come to mind and it fell out of my brain. Um, well, oh, while like, I was gonna say, while you're, while you're thinking about that, one thing I see a lot of companies doing is revolving around another purpose. So are we doing something as an organization to help our community, whether that's education, uh, building something to help healthcare or whatever it is. And I found that really lift the spirits because now everyone's in it for another bigger purpose as well. Um, I know, a t I love that you said that. I know a team who has, uh, is learning how to make the, sew the masks that everyone that you can do from home. So they've, they provided uh, the, the patterns for the masks and they sent people fabric if they didn't have it. Uh, and have shown people how to, you know, are, are that there's a team who has engaged men and women, which I think is fantastic in making these masks for first responders. So I totally agree. Things like that work super well. Um, one thing, a Monday morning coffee. So I know a company who is doing a Monday morning coffee at 10 a.m. There's an, the Zoom room is open for an hour and you can come in with your cup of coffee and just kind of chat and they can do breakout rooms if people want to have private conversations. And that makes people feel like they're still connected. One thing you don't want to do is offer those things outside of normal work hours because there's already enough burden on people. So doing things like a happy hour after work, don't do that. That is not going to help people feel connected. It's going to feel like an, another thing they have to do after hours. 
Um, the other thing, and this is the triads piece that I think is, I have seen work really well, is, and HR is uniquely able to do this, by the way, and that is to connect people together who may not know each other super well, depending on the size of the organization, or may not have a ton of interaction, but are, you know, they have kids a similar age, they have, they're from a similar place, they live in a similar neighborhood, whatever the case may be, and actually put them together to have conversations, 15 minutes, get to know each other, feel that connection, someone who they have something in common with, they went to the same school, whatever it is, and, and put them in groups of three, so it's not a burden on two people to, to try and keep this going, and just for support and connection. And that is working really well in a lot of the organizations that I have seen implement that. If you use Slack, there's an app called Donut that'll just randomly introduce you to a colleague, <laughs> and uh, it's a good way to force conversation there. I love that you put, said that because someone else was telling me about that recently and I had not heard of it. So that is, uh, that is a great one. Cool. Um, All right. You have a couple more minutes. What's the last most important thing that we, we should talk about and uh, discuss? <laughs> um, I am going to say, I'm going to actually talk about ghost expectations. Skip all this stuff. I told you I was going to have too much time. I was going to have too much stuff. See, I know. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to talk about this because um, I think it's really important. So ghost expectations are the invisible expectations that we place on people around us and things around us. And especially when it comes to behavior. So they're often baked into the assumptions that we have about how things work or how we work or how people work. Um, we don't talk about them. They're not verbalized. They're not put into place. They're undocumented. Um, but they drive how we think about how things work. In an environment where we are with people every day and where we're seeing people, there are lots of times and opportunities to disprove those ghost expectations or to quiet them down or to go and check with someone about like, hey, did you notice that thing over there? Is that a thing that, you, is, that, is, that you're aware of, right? You can do it, you have checkpoints in person. We don't have that as much when we are in a remote environment. We operate more from our assumptions. We operate more from these ghost expectations. And they can be really, really toxic and damaging in a remote environment because we are not taking the time to address them or bring them to life or talk about them or even acknowledge that they are there. So um, being aware of and pointing out, not only having HR point out to leaders where they might be running from a ghost expectation, um, where there might be, you can question the expectation and what the assumptions are and actually doing that, encouraging leaders to do that with their team, and then encouraging teams to do that to their leaders is really important right now because those ghost expectations can drive very toxic behaviors, can drive very toxic assumptions, and it is a lot harder to manage or mitigate them in a remote environment when we are operating from these unspoken, invisible uh, assumptions that drive how we see people and how they're working around us. Awesome. So it looks like we're at 201. Uh, I appreciate that. I know, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, we both said we can stay a couple more minutes if necessary for a couple of questions. So happy to, to take some questions as we, uh, as we wrap up for some of the folks that need to, to head off to another meeting, uh, you know, obviously feel free to and appreciate your time. Um, so there were, there were a couple of questions um, uh, about ghost expectations, an yes. example of one, a common one. So just more specifically. Sure. So I'll give you a, um, I'll give you a common one that is less toxic when we're in person in a work environment that is a lot, can be a lot more insidious in a, um, when you're in a remote environment. So a ghost expectation can be something like if I send an email, I expect no matter if it's a 10 PM. And by the way, I worked for a boss who was like this. So I will, I will actually tell a story. I worked for a boss who, this is back in the day, for those of you who are as old as I am, when Blackberries were a thing. And he was like a master Blackberrier. And he would send an email at 10 o'clock at night with a question. 
And he would expect, because as soon as I had a BlackBerry, that I was going to respond to it within five minutes. Because he was a person who was constantly on his phone. So he had a, a ghost expectation that because I had been given a BlackBerry and because I could respond whenever, because I had this at home, I was going to be doing it. And this was a ghost expectation that I was responding to. So I would do it because he never said this is expected of you. He never said these are the rules, but it just, he was so quick about it that I was like, obviously I have to do the same thing. Obviously I have to work a weekend. Obviously I have to do this thing. Those ghost expectations they're not great. I want to be fully clear. They're not great in a day-to-day -day environment, but when we have more of a sense of how people are working and what they're doing, they can slide a little bit more. Those ghost expectations driving behavior at home. So um, that you're still going to respond on a weekend or that you're, you're, you're answering in five minutes when now you are also homeschooling your children, when now you are also cooking three meals a day, when now you are also whatever the case may be, they become really toxic because we're not seeing what people are doing. We're not seeing the actual behaviors and what's happening around them. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense to me. Okay. I can't see if anyone else is head nodding, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually another question that came up was about just any ideas of how to improve people's well-being um and it, i can't see the question anymore it disappeared but it was around well-being and, and i'm not sure if you have any thoughts but one thing that i've uh, very specifically thought about as a leader in this time is there's two parts of well-being right one is from a physical environment so you know do people have what they need the tools or resources to work remotely or in their changed environment and the other one is on the mental side of things right we actually need everyone to bounce back mentally after all of this especially when we're asking probably people to do more with less um, so if there's anything from a, from a mental perspective, whether it is showing that empathy, whether it is you know, there's uh, companies that are providing free apps when it comes to meditation or other resources that can help them um, think about both elements of physical and mental um, when it comes to thinking about people's well-being. And the other part of well-being is double down on gratitude, right? Thank people for what they're doing. Uh, this is a different environment recognition is free <laughs> it's an intrinsic motivator and if people really understand that you value their time through these changes uh it's a really great way to get people's intrinsic motivators going well which which really influences their their mental well-being as well i want to just add something to that because that's a really great point um i love the idea of starting meetings with gratitude so i know a team who's doing this where at the beginning of every meeting their leader says you know what is one thing that you're grateful for today. And everyone goes around and they say it in one word, right? I'm, I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for my cats. I'm grateful for, you know, Rob for helping me with it. Like it's very quick and dirty, but it starts the meeting from that place of gratitude. So you can involve and, and enable people um, to have that as part of your actual meeting structure. Another thing you can do, and this is, you know, Mental well-being is very important and ignoring that some people are struggling and, and are having negative feelings is very unhealthy. So another thing you can do is at the beginning of a meeting, you can ask people in one word, how are you feeling today? And if someone says anxious, it's fine. It, you're not asking for an explanation. You're just acknowledging that everyone is where they are and it's okay for them to feel whatever they're feeling. So making that space for people to feel that and to make it okay to share that, again, it makes them feel like they're not alone because one of the challenges is that people feel really alone. So whether you can bring people in to do a guided meditation that people can join, if that's a thing that your company wants to do, it doesn't have to be expensive. It can be on Zoom. You know, I know a breathwork facilitator who's doing a lot of those right now for companies. Um, you can bring, you can offer coaching to you can have your people internally coach each other you can turn those triads into mini coaching sessions you can have the there's lots of apps you can give people trials for apps there's lots of ways to do it depending on the situation we, we actually for like 20 30 bucks sent like succulents to people's houses just as a way to brighten up their kind of you know their desk their remote work environment and my gosh the, the, the positivity that came out of it some people were like like i'm the only living thing in this place and then now there's another one and it just that's another way to really share you know show that we're worrying you know we care about them there's something there to brighten their day give them a smile because people do feel isolated at this moment as well so 
a good Absolutely. idea there, Salim. All right, so we went way over, which is fine. I appreciate the, the questions and the comments. Uh, so thanks everyone that's you know that stuck around. A good kind of more than half of you. Um, appreciate everyone's time and attention and participation today, uh, most importantly, to make it a bit more of a conversation. Uh, Celine, thanks so much for spending time out of your busy day and donating that for, uh, you know, for this group and team as well.